when he finally jumps on the fire truck, what you hear is this like super low rumbling bass that's like super heavily side chained, and it's actually a sound from from a from a truck. <laughs> So I recorded that, put it in the computer, just pitched it down and put a note to it and put it on the bass track and like sidechain it. What is this? I honestly don't even know what this is. It was like a sticker. I just never bothered to get the sticker off. But now that people are looking at me, I'm kind of thinking I should clean it up a little bit. What's up, YouTube family? Okay, let's do this. So I wanted to make a quick video about a composing technique Ludwig Göransson used in the film score for the movie Tenet. In an interview, which I will link in the description, Ludwig talks about creating a bass effect for the cue Trucks in Place, where the protagonist jumps onto a truck using field recordings of an actual truck engine. Now, many people would say this film trend where the line between the film score and sound design are blurred is a distinctly modern technique. The classic example is the cinematic Brahm effect that Hans Zimmer created for another Nolan film, Inception which is much more sound design than music per se. Johan Johansson built on this trend further for soundtracks such as the one he designed for the film Arrival, which incorporates vocalizing elements meant to evoke the themes of linguistics in the film and the otherworldly circular language of the alien species. However, blurring the line between sound design and music isn't new. The soundtrack to Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds is a famous example. For the production of the movie, Hitchcock dispensed with the score from his usual collaborator Bernard Herrmann and instead opted for an electronically synthesized soundtrack simulating bird sounds designed by Oscar Sala. Alongside the development of electronic synthesizers in music, experimental composers were beginning to play with sampled music and the ability to process pre-recorded sounds into new compositions. And no, I'm not talking about hip-hop, this is before that. The movement came to be called Music Concrete and soon made its way into film schools. Think of classic sci-fi and horror where oftentimes music scores are dispensed with entirely in favor of tension building sound design and drones a lot of these scores are rooted in the music concrete music of the 1900s this so-called modern music which is now ironically dated sounds otherworldly to say the least and pairs well with the strange worlds that these directors were creating if you want to learn more about the music concrete movement of the 1900s and other modern music movements i recommend the book electric sound by joel chatter I had to read it in my introduction to electronic music class in college, and I actually found it very interesting. So, no, the marrying of sound design in film composing is not new. But in the contemporary sense, I think what Ludwig is doing is something unique and interesting, particularly his example of trucks in place. By the end of his processing, nobody listening is going to be able to tell that his sidechain bass is actually a manipulated recording of a truck engine. It just sounds like a sidechain bass. But is there a subliminal benefit that comes from this world building approach to film composing? Maybe there's a recognition in our subconscious mind that the the created soundscape somehow belongs orally in the environment of the film in a way that our conscious mind can't articulate. I don't really know, but I do know that the score for Tenet would have sounded very different if Ludwig had made different creative decisions. The concept of creating music from environmental sounds might be limiting, or it could spur interesting and unique ideas that help tell the creative story. So for this video, I just wanted to show a couple ways that I've incorporated sound design into my music production and maybe offer some ideas for your own exploration. Let's jump into it. So I have pulled up here a cue for a short film I worked on. Pretty simple, mostly strings. This was a pretty delicate cue. Actually, let me see if I can pull you up a bit of the film that I was working on. I don't want to play too much, but essentially it kind of revolves around this theme of water and you hear this kind of ominous water sound design throughout the film. It has to do with this lady in a bathtub. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to kind of play on that theme. And one of the ways I did it was with this pad that I'm about to show you. 
Let me just strip all of the effects off of this. It's just a brook. It's like someone recorded a creek, and I think I found it on YouTube, downloaded it, threw it into Ableton, and then started messing with it until I came up with this. This kind of ethereal pad that kind of evokes that sense of water. Walking you through what I actually did to the track, there's really not a whole lot at play. Really, the key part is a resonator, just a stock Ableton plugin. So again, here's the pad with nothing, just water. I turn on the resonator and all of a sudden we have some harmony, we have some music happening. So what I did is I tuned the resonator to the key of the Q, which in this case is B flat mixolydian. So each one of these is essentially a different note. The first note that I have to set is the root note, which in this case is B flat. I guess I decided I didn't want that root B flat in it, but you have to set that note first on this plugin because all the other notes are in relation to that first note. So the first note is a B flat, but you're not hearing that. It's not audible. The next note that I programmed was 10 semitones up. So it's a A flat. It's the dominant seventh of the root note. If you're wearing headphones, you might hear that in your left ear, I guess. The next one I programmed, that's a fifth, but it's 19 semitones up from the root note, so it's higher than the seventh. And then the next one I programmed was the B flat up at the top. Um, and then it looks like I also decided to add a lower B flat. So kind of creates that uh, Mixolydian sound, but it also leaves it open because I was playing with the suspensions. And so I didn't want the third to muddy it up because if I am have a third in that pad that's holding and then my melody is playing with suspensions, the suspended fourth especially, then you're gonna create some distance there because the, the third will clash with the suspended fourth. Something else I did with the Convolution Reverb, the Max for Live plugin, I am using an experimental patch here. It's obviously adding a B flat, and then it's also adding, you hear, that third up at the top. It's a harmonic of some sort, I guess. That adds quite a bit of character. So again, with just the resonator, then with this reverb patch, it adds a lot of top end sheen. Now, if I take the resonator out, you still have that top end sheen, but you don't have half of the character. So really these two effects are working in tandem to really make this sound. And the last one is kind of a reverb patch, adds a little bit of movement and that's it. So we have this sense of water. So I thought that was pretty cool, but let me show you something else. Okay, so this track is a little bit different, kind of a cinematic trap beat. I'm not gonna play the whole track, but let me just play the drop and you're gonna hear what sounds like a ripping lead guitar scream. So that lead guitar scream. It is not actually a lead guitar, that is my voice. That's me singing into my mic and then adding a bunch of effects. Let me turn everything off and show you what's actually happening. It sounds so bad. <laughs> so what's happening and what it essentially turned out to be. So let's dive into this a little bit more. I just sing into my mic, I sing the notes. Didn't even spend a lot of time getting a good recording because I knew it was gonna be mangled up. You can hear I'm listening to the track, the beat that I already created in my headphones and it's bleeding through and you can pick it up in the mic. <laughs> We start with that first thing. I'm already singing kind of high because I know I need the melody up there, but then I go ahead and pitch it up again. This is an octave up. Still sounds terrible, right? Now I'm adding, I'm adding a lot of stuff here. We're starting with a little waves plugin. This is driver. I don't know if it's just me, but I still don't fully understand this plugin. It does some strange things. Sometimes you can get some cool sounds out of it. In this case, at the settings I currently have it on, this is what I had. 
which maybe is like halfway there. But you can still, to me, you can still tell that that's a human voice. Here's another distortion knob, and this one is waves as well. It's just the one knob. It doesn't give you a lot of options. But I find this kind of mellows things out. It takes out some of the hushness. This is an experimental reverb, and it's basically a kickback. It kind of sounds almost like you're doubling. Very short reverb time, almost like a phaser. Next thing, I'm adding some old trusty. This is a stock Ableton plugin, a saturator, and this is again adding more drive. Next thing, I'm passing it through a course, again, just mangling it more. Some EQ. Get rid of all the lows. Some more EQ. That was probably mixing to get it to sit right in the track. Last thing I'm doing is, and this is on the bus track, a little EQ on the highs, a little bit of delay to wash things out a little more. I'm adding a reverb to wash things out again. This is it dry. And now this is me adding the washy effects. And again, the track in context. kind of funny when you think about it. The history of music is really the history of boredom. We get bored of an existing song and we want to hear a new song. We get bored of existing genres and we create new genres. We get bored of existing instruments and we invent new instruments. But the trajectory is not so much flat like a street as it is vertical like a pyramid. The footprint of the past supports the weight of the future and we continuously reference the past as much as we repeat it. As people are fond of saying, we truly do stand on the shoulders of giants. So alongside pioneering new tricks and techniques, it's a good idea to look at the past for inspiration. And it's often the case that the most innovative ideas come from that practice. You would be hard pressed to find a musician alive today that wouldn't immediately reference their favorite childhood records and musical experiences when asked what inspired the musician they are today. Ludwig Göransson is an inspiring composer, and he will certainly inspire an untold number of composers in the future, who will go on to innovate on the techniques he is innovating on today, taking things further and in directions we couldn't even imagine. In that spirit, incorporating environmental sounds into your musical production is definitely not a science and you shouldn't approach it like one. Yes, there are techniques you can learn from and examples you can take inspiration from, but at the end of the day, it's going to come up to your imagination to fit the idea to the track in a way that serves the creative vision. At the very least, I hope I provided a couple ideas that might give you a place to start. If you do create something using this technique, let me know and I would love to hear it. Until next time, good luck creating.